um, we were just kind of having a conversation here about the church and everything going on in the church. Uh, one of the things during the scripture study that we if we do a lot, if you come, when we hopefully get past all this mess, is uh, we talk about current events, we talk about different stuff. Some talk about it more than others. Um, but uh, I like to talk about current events because we can relate them to the scriptures. So we're going to start off, uh, this is our second Sunday of Easter, uh, it's year A, we go through uh, each year you have year A, year B, year C. Um, we've got the reading of Acts, the reading of Peter, and the reading of John. And what's interesting, and Basil can elaborate on this, but okay, so as we get into the Easter season, normally our readings are going to be an Old Testament reading, okay, um, and then... <clears throat> A reading, which is normally a letter for Paul, all right, uh, in ordinary time. And then a gospel is our gospel, of course. And then each gospel for each year is something different. I think we got John this year, uh, Matthew next year, B, and then Luke, I believe. Uh, but nonetheless, so we have our second reading is from Peter, and then that rotates, I think, every A, B, and C. It goes from Peter to John. Peter and John are the two primary uh, ones. You also have James, the epistles of James, but uh, Peter and John are the primary ones as we go through the Easter season uh, in our second readings. Uh, what about Acts? Is there, as far as our first readings? Is Gen that yeah, one? generally Acts will be the reading for the first reading, just different parts of Acts will be uh, in the first reading, dealing with the early church right after the resurrection. So. Yeah. And then, it, and then I think in the in year C, uh, we do revelations in yep. the second readings. So that's how the church kind of splits everything up. And, and you probably heard it said that if you go through a three-year period, um, is it coming on Sundays or is it every day? I think it's Sundays. Sundays. The, uh, you will hear the whole Bible, mm -hmm. in essence, uh, with some things, I think. But for the most part, you will hear the whole Bible because you have the Psalms and you have everything else. Okay. So. So. I guess uh, for an opening prayer, today is also, in addition to second uh, Sunday of Easter, it is Divine Mercy Sunday. So we can go ahead and uh, start with, I guess, the Divine Mercy Chaplet Prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy, mercy on us and on the whole world. world. And we'll do the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, Hail Mary full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed, blessed art thou amongst women, women and blessed, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father. One Son, quick thing. Prayer. Yep. We usually pray before we start this for the Holy Spirit to come upon us. So let's do that real quick. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit upon our hearts to open up our hearts so that what we may talk about today comes from you and not from us. Uh, Holy Father, please fill our hearts with that grace. We ask this in your holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Bless the Holy Spirit. So, like I said, today is Divine Mercy Sunday. Uh, as between the two of us, Mitch is by far the uh, expert on Marian apparitions, so I'm going <laughs> to defer to him, especially on this one. So, yeah, it's uh, it, and you know the thing about uh, th this particular apparition, this apparition was uh, it's Divine Mercy, okay, and uh, it's it's more Jesus apparition, okay. To to let's go ahead and go to the next okay. slide. This is that that particular. Uh, slide that you saw a minute ago was the picture or the painting that uh, St. Faustina was commissioned to make by Jesus himself. And go back to that picture real quick. Okay. Okay, so what you see is you see the red and the white and it's his mercy, okay, and it's his 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 uh, suffering that, that in essence saved us. And, and 
but it's his pouring out of mercy, which is the primary uh, push for this particular private revelation. It's a private revelation. And, and please remember that a private revelation is not something you have to really follow. It, it, it's out there. Uh, God comes to various people, uh, whether it be through Mary, whether it be through Jesus, okay, himself coming, or whether it be through an angel of some sort. And there, there have been apparitions of that nature. And the church is the one who investigates these things, and they rule on it. Um, go ahead and go to... Uh, uh, so basically what happened with this, and, and Basil and I were having a conversation before this, and he is right at one point in time that the church did not... They, they condemned this particular apparition. And you could go read all the different things about it, but the primary reason they condemned it is because there wasn't a good translation of... Uh, St. Faustina's Bible. Um, so the translations were kind of weird and some of the stuff that was they were reading was weird and it didn't fall in line with Scripture. And this is what the church is for. The church is, is, was given to us to help us uh, in our discernment process. So after uh, 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 Pope, uh, John Paul came along, John Paul II, who was from Poland, and uh, she is from Poland too, there was a better, and actually it's before him, but there was a better interpretation of her Bible that, not her Bible, her, her, yeah, her diary that came about, okay? And from that, uh, some of the stuff that was confusing um, was, was cleared up in essence. And it did not go against scripture or doctrine or, or that kind of thing. But let's go ahead and jump. Sister Faustina was born in, in August, on August 25th in 1905 in Poland. Uh, she was from a poor religious family of peasants and the third of ten children. Uh, she attended school for three years. Her parents would not let her enter a convent. She did want to go into a convent. Uh, being at the age of 16, Helen left her home and went to work as a housekeeper uh, to help the family. Okay. Now, I, mean, I, I would focus a little bit on the only the three years of education in that, you know, God goes and reveals things to everyone. Uh, and he doesn't always pick the, the smartest, most intelligent, most educated. He will go to whoever he chooses. And I think his normal, his normal process is to go to the more um, lower, lower, or, or not necessarily lower, but the uneducated or yeah. the poor. Or the second born instead right. of the first born. And it's more of a humble thing, yeah. humbling thing, because he himself came into this world as... Uh, a poor child, yeah. and and so that's what that's what he does. Um, so at the age of twenty, she entered into the congregation of Sisters of Our Lady of Mercy. Uh, she took the name Sister Maria Faustina of the Most Blessed Sacrament. Um, Sister Maria Faustina was the secretary of His Mercy, so that she could tell the world about His great message, which Sister Faustina recorded in her diary titled "Divine Mercy of My Soul." Okay, so. The primary thing about that is Jesus would come to her in apparitions daily for the most part. Um, and she, she would interpret or write down, and that's what he wanted her to do. He pr pronounced her as, in essence, his secretary. Mm -hmm. And that from that, that she would dictate uh, everything that he, he wanted to be dictated about his mercy and how his mercy is going to be open uh, for us, okay? Especially in the times to come that are going to be extremely difficult. And if we think about it, right now we are have some definitely some difficult times. So there was, she has a book, and I, and I think her diary is like that thick. And if you've ever tried to read it, um, you know it's it's crazy if you want to try to get through the whole thing. I have read most of it, uh, and actually misplaced. I think I gave it to somebody. I hadn't seen it since. I need to give you another one, but. Uh, it's, it's got a lot of really good information. Uh, it talks, there's various things that she talks about. Um, very, very interesting. If you, if you, in fact, I think we had some, we'll, we'll post out on YouTube and on Facebook some links so that you can go and read more about St. Faustina. And actually, she's going to be, in essence, the saint I pushed today because this is Divine Mercy Sunday. Every, every Sunday after Easter is a Divine Mercy Sunday. And uh, we start on, and yeah, John Paul II canonized her in 2000, okay? And she died at 33, which is, again, one of those things uh, that 
it's talked about she died the same age Jesus supposedly had died at 33 years old and all that. Uh, but we do have a novena, and that novena starts usually, it starts on Good Friday. And you go from Good Friday, it's a nine days, and, and a novena is a nine-day prayer. It's not just for those of you who don't really know much about novenas. A novena is, you can do it, there's all kinds of novenas out there we can pray. Um, but this particular one, it was put into the church um, for this particular reason, okay? To have that Divine Mercy Divine Mercy Sunday. So you would pray for nine days, and then uh, you would celebrate on the feast day. Uh, for each of the nine days that, that, uh, that for this particular novena, St. Faustina was given a different group of people to pray for. So each day, when you read through this particular novena, you're praying for different groups of people. It could be you're praying for the religious, the priest, for people that are deeply committed to God, for people that don't know God, uh, and last night was the last night, and we prayed people that are lukewarm. And those are the ones, these are the ones that Jesus said to Faustina, and he said it in Scripture too, that hurt him the most. That on, when he was on the cross, he suffered the most for lukewarm uh, people. And, and lukewarm people are ones that go sit in the pew, okay, and then go home and do nothing. Um, or they may not even sit in the pew. Okay? They profess with their mouth, but they don't act upon it. And I think we all kind of fall in that sometimes. Uh, so it's something that we can look at internally. But uh, that's what this novena is, is about. Uh, yeah, let me read this to you. I desire that during these nine days you bring souls to the fountain of my mercy, that they may draw there from strength and refreshment and whatever grace they have need of in the hardships of life and especially at the hour of death so so uh this is one thing that i have done many a times uh there was many promises that christ made if you prayed this uh if you prayed the divine mercy chaplet over somebody who was who was dying and i've done this many times because i believe in his his promise uh, so again it's not something you have to do but it is something that he gave us uh, in, in private revelation. Uh, again, we'll have links and you can go watch and listen to all of the, uh, all of the different things about it. Well, incidentally, they do have one particular one me and my wife usually use, and it's when they sing it. They sing the Divine Mercy, and there's three individuals. Chaplain. Yeah, the chaplet. And it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. So go listen to it. Anyway, all right. There you go. Here we go. We're uh, going to start our first reading. Uh, the model church, I guess it's uh, Acts 40, chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. Uh, I'll go ahead and read it since Mitch has been doing a lot of talking. You can actually look up questions if there are any. Yeah. Uh, reading from the book of Acts. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. All came upon everyone, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their property and possessions and divide them among all according to each one's need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple area and to breaking bread in their homes. They ate their meals with exultation and sincerity of heart, praising God and enjoying favor with all the people. And every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. So pretty uh, positive reading. Uh, we, we just got through with Good Friday, Holy Week, the Paschal ministry where, you know, Christ was uh, judged, condemned, beaten, scourged, crucified, died. Now we're uh, at the point where Christ is risen uh, from the dead and God's people, uh, the church, appear to have this early uh, good time, uh, mm -hmm. growth and uh, communion. So I guess uh, quickly, I guess the teaching of the apostles, it's important to remember that we did not have a New Testament at this time, nor did we have a really a full table of contents for the New Testament until well into the 300s. 
So when the book of Acts refers to this teaching of the apostles, uh, the gospel was proclaimed verbally uh, to, to everyone. Now, you know, and therefore that was their uh, source for the gospel was, was the, the, the apostles themselves. And that continues through the church, through the years, all the way to today. We have this magisterium, this, this hierarchy of truth where divine revelation is revealed through them and it was only later put into writing. So that's what that teaching the apostles question was about. Uh, had all things in common. Uh, if you notice there was a sentence in there that uh, they, oh, let's go ahead and go back there. They would sit, they had all things in common, sell their property and possessions and divide them among all according to one's need. Uh, a lot of times, Various political belief systems will incorporate or attempt to incorporate this verse into their ideology, uh, thinking specifically of socialism or communism. And really, this was a group of individuals forming a community, a very small one, deciding to do this, uh, this method of, of sharing. It was not a government-sanctioned or government-required redistribution of wealth or anything like that. Uh, so that concept is, is foreign to the, the people in the Book of Acts. I mean, no, you're right. It's, uh, it was a voluntary thing. It wasn't something that was forced upon them. And as they grew, um, some of the same tenants, I mean, not some, most of the same tenants stayed there. Uh, it was feeding the poor, uh, you know, caring for the widow. caring for the, and so in essence, you were caring for your community, and that lives with, with us today. Yeah, what they were doing is exactly what we should be doing: is through the community of the church, we should help the entire community at the smallest and, level possible. At the smallest level possible. So they were doing that. They were they were participating. They were active. They weren't lukewarm. Yep, they weren't lukewarm. So another another part is uh, meeting together in the temple area and the breaking of bread. And I guess what we can see there already is the the parts of the mass uh, that these this community uh, would meet in the temple area, and that's where they would go through the word. That would be the the, the Old Testament scriptures uh, that were available to them at the time, and and possibly a homily that included parts of the gospel. So that, that's the temple area. And then the breaking of the bread, of course, would be uh, the liturgy of the Eucharist, where they partook in what Christ instituted at the Last Supper. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that's a very important part of it, too. And I think uh, these are hallmarks of the catechism, too. Uh, as you break down the catechism, I think it's broken down in four parts. And it, it's pretty much this right here, okay, as you look at each part of it. Uh, it goes through these four things, and, and the Eucharist being the primary, uh, to the communal uh, breaking of bread and, and uh, worshiping Christ together. Okay. Uh, second reading is from the letter of First Peter, uh, pretty much at the beginning of the letter, and we're gonna go. I'll go ahead and read that, and we'll go from there. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who in his great mercy gave us a new birth to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by the power of God are safeguarded through faith, to a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the final time. In this you rejoice, although now for a little while you may have to suffer through various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that is perishable, even though tested by fire, may prove to be for praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Although you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, yet believe in him, you rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. As you attain the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So, you want to, let's go back to the first part here. Yeah. Really didn't have any questions on it, but uh, I guess there's a salutation or a beginning 
of Thanksgiving, where we're talking about blessings upon those in God the Father. Uh, the inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. I guess that's that eternal uh, reward that we're all trying to, to, to achieve through Christ. The, uh, what I love about this, too, is who in his great mercy, again, we see mercy. Mercy is all through there uh, and through the, the, the New Testament. But gave us a new birth to a living hope. Okay, through the resurrection of Christ. And I, I, you know, I put out a video on Facebook and I told everybody to go make themselves new. And that's in essence what I'm talking about here is that Jesus brought about a newness, um, a newness in the spirit. And uh, we, as followers of Jesus, uh, should always continue to make ourselves new. To every day, every day, uh, push the envelope on doing his will. And that's essentially what Paul is saying here. He's repeating Peter. that. Yeah. Uh, Peter, again, Peter. Uh, kept in heaven for you by the power of God is safeguarded through faith, a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the final time. All right. Uh, here's a part, an important part right in the middle of this thanksgiving and salutation and blessings for the, the, the mercy of God. Now, for a little while, you may have to suffer through various trials. So, you know, life is not going to be uh, perfect, and we are going to go through our ups and downs through life, despite uh, believing in Christ and having hope for salvation in eternal uh, eternity with God in heaven. So that's just the way the fallen world is. Uh, when Adam sinned, not only did mankind fall out of union and perfection with God, creation uh, was no longer perfect and in union with God. And, it, and actually another part of scripture, creation groans with anticipation for that reunion with God. And so because we are in a fallen world, things happen, uh, natural and supernatural, that uh, cause us to suffer in this world. So it's an important part to understand that we're not uh, a faith that believes that everything is gonna be rose colored glasses and uh, perfect once we're a part of the church. No, this world has fallen, we will encounter suffering. That's right. Um, and again, I think it, and it'll be reiterated in the gospel of that we live by faith, we live by that spirit. And we'll see that more in the gospel, and that's what Peter is saying here too, uh, and how we how we can attain this. And here's another important one right here. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And this was written, uh, you know, later after uh, the resurrection had happened and after he had ascended into heaven. This letter was written, and he's referring to the community, many of whom are new Christians and had not seen Jesus in person uh, even though you do not see him now yet believe in him so uh, that alludes to what happened earlier and we'll be seeing later right. in the gospel uh, that, that our goal of faith is what we need to have that reliance in uh, belief and faith in Jesus Christ anything else on that? no it's just that uh, Peter was commissioned well him and so Peter and, and most of the other apostles went to uh, most of the Jews that, that were dispersed. They were dispensed uh, out. And um, Paul, again, went to the Gentiles. And I think that's it kind of talks about that a little bit in there, uh, what Peter was doing. Okay. So here we are. We're getting to the uh, gospel, which is from John. And this is going to be occurring uh, in the upper room where they are hiding <laughs> right after the uh, crucifixion uh, and death of Jesus Christ uh, let's see what I have here the apostles are scared uh, the Holy Spirit hasn't entered them Pentecost hasn't happened so they're, they're just relying on their humanity and uh, their leader has died a horrible death uh, the author was John, son of Zebedee, disciple whom Jesus loved. And you see all through John, uh, he refers to himself that way, the disciple whom Jesus loved, uh, not taking on a, uh, his name. So he's a Palestinian, Palestinian Jew, one of the apostles, 
And uh, I guess we can go into it. You want to read yeah. this one? Yeah, I'll read it since you've read the, the other. <clears throat> Gospel according to John. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the doors were locked, where the disciples were, for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I said you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger into the nail marks, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now a week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and bring your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through his belief, through this belief, you may have life in his name. Okay, kind of a long reading, um, and, and one of the key parts of this reading was the statement regarding uh, when you retain things on earth, they are retained in heaven. And, and I guess that's the, the basis for the Catholic understanding of the sacrament of confession. So I wanted to, to take a little time and go through that sacrament uh, and its scriptural and early church history basis. Uh, a lot of the, you know, almost all of the Protestant faiths have uh, gotten rid of that sacrament. Uh, ever since the Protestant Reformation, you typically see uh, most mainline churches have a belief in baptism or even some form of Eucharist that's not consecrated, but the belief in some type of Eucharist. But almost none of them have this belief in confession specifically to a priest. And what we want to look through here is the scriptural and early church history basis for that sacrament. So when we start off, let's see, uh, let's define a sacrament. It's an outward sign of an inward grace instituted by Christ himself. So in this particular case of confession... The outward sign is the absolution of sins. When the priest gives that absolution, that is an outward sign of him telling you you're forgiven of your sins. The inward grace is that it actually affects the spiritual side. It, it cleanses your soul as you speak. As he speaks those words, something internally, spiritually happens. And that's the inward grace. Uh, instituted by Christ, and we'll see this through these readings, that Christ himself gave this power to his apostles, actually first to Peter, then to the apostles, and the apostles are the first bishops who then give the power to the presbyters or the priests later on. Right. Through what's called apostolic succession. Yeah. So in Matthew chapter 16... We have the apostles walking along Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus is asking them, who do people say that I am? And they say various answers, and then Peter replies that you are Christ, the Son of the living God. And because of this answer, Jesus, uh, as a part of his response, goes here. You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. 
Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So there we see a couple of things. The hierarchy of the church is being commissioned in that the leadership role of steward, who is going to be the uh, human head of the church, is going to be Peter in this case, and then apostolic succession later on, different people will take on that role of the head of the church. And that scene, of course, we see the first uh, apostolic succession with Matthias, right? Yes. Uh, so Matthias was brought in by the apostles themselves, okay, because Judas hung himself and was, was out of it, okay? So they had to, to commission another person in that 12th spot. And that were that succession that was done by the apostles, not by Jesus, yeah. but by the apostles. Okay, so that shows that succession and how that's happened over the years and years and years as that that is followed. And so, uh, what the binding and loosing alludes to is in the Old Testament, the kings had a steward, and that steward had judicial control. They could make rulings of secular or, or spiritual matters and their ruling was binding because the king gave the steward that power and therefore that binding on earth in the Old Testament uh, was, was ratified because the king gave him that power. Now we see that Jesus, the son of God, is granting this power to the steward of Peter but he's also giving him this heavenly duty, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. So this, this thought that uh, the powers that the, the priesthood or that the, the Pope and what we'll see in the next reading, the bishops have, is heaven's going to listen to this. Heaven's going to, uh, Jesus is granting this power to earthly people that will bind in heaven. What they say goes. And I think it's important because later on we're going to see how that's able to happen. Yeah. And that's able to happen. Now, uh, I don't know if we get to this in a minute, but the, when he breathed upon him. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, so again, are you going to talk about that in a minute? I don't want to jump back. Uh, it'll be in the, next, in the third, second reading. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, we'll see that in a minute on the breathing upon his, upon his apostles. So, two chapters later from Matthew 16, we get to Matthew 18, and we see a commissioning of all the apostles now. We have Peter with the keys, he will be the head, and then we have all of the apostles who are the bishops getting the same power to bind and loose. Uh, amen, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The same commission given to Peter is now given to the apostles or the, the bishops at the time. So, again, granting them the power to do this binding and loosing, which correlates with forgiveness of sins or not forgiveness of sins. That's what the, the binding would be, not forgiving it. The loosing would be loosing or forgiving of those sins. Uh, here's part of today's reading. Uh, you want to read that part? Uh, yeah, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. Again, commissioning them, sending them out. Uh, and when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And go ahead, Basil. This, this is well. A, this is kind of this is very important. This, you know, the fact this is a form of the Pentecost. I guess one of the stories of it is in that the the Holy Spirit. You have God the Son uh, speaking to the apostles, and then that breathing is how they receive the Holy Spirit. And therefore, you know, you see that Trinitarian part right there. The Father has sent me. Jesus the Son, breathing the Holy Spirit. So that whole Trinitarian relationship and that giving of that power of the Holy Spirit to the apostles, that is what actually gives them the power to bind and loose. It's through the Holy Spirit in the person of Christ, the priest can do that. And this is important because this goes back to Genesis when, when God breathed upon our breath, breathed breath into Adam. Okay, he was, he was giving him life through that breath. And so what Jesus is doing here is he is giving a spiritual life. Okay, so we reflect again, we go back to, to God when he created, 
He created everything was physical in the Old Testament. Everything's physical. And what Jesus was doing, he was ushering in in the age that we live in now, the age of faith. Okay? I said, okay, sorry, we're not. Uh, and so basically, that he is breathing that spirit into his apostles. And that is that new life. Mm -hmm. That is that new life that we are to live, that spiritual life uh, that, that he is giving to them. Okay. So next reading is from 2 Corinthians. Paul writes this, And to whom you have pardoned anything, I also. For what have I pardoned if I have pardoned anything? For your sakes have I done it in the person of Christ. Again, like I was stating, that when the priest forgives sins, it is in the person of Christ. And this is Paul alluding to that. I have done it in the person of Christ, that forgiveness, that pardoning or forgiveness. These are, this is important, too, because what, what we're saying here is, uh, what is it? What in, God, I'm having a brain hiccup up here. Uh, no, 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 in, in the person of Christ. In, uh, like, in persona Christi. In persona Christi. Okay, so when a priest tells you, when, he, when you're in there and he's absolving you and giving you, he is not actually, it's in the person of Christ that is forgiving your sin. And it is through it, his ordination. That it is through his power. ordination. He is a special grace that we don't have as, as you know, lay people. As lay people. Or even deacons or anything. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So a priest has these charisms that they have and that they can do through this breathing upon which is passed down from the bishop. Again, the bishop breathes upon the priest. Yep. So it's all passed down. And it's, it's something that hasn't broke. And another thing, when we go back and look at that particular reading, we see that it says, you know, to whom sins are forgiven, they are forgiven. Yes, we all, you know, Jesus said, forgive your brother 70 times 7, right? But this is not what he's talking about when he's talking to his, his apostles. He's given specific orders, mm -hmm. and those specific orders are, I am giving you this. You are going to be able to forgive sins, absolve sins. You also are going to be able to retain those sins. So nowhere does Jesus tell us as, as just individuals to, hey, if you don't want to forgive them, then you don't forgive them. Yeah. No, he always says forgive somebody. Always forgive them. But specifically to his apostles, he tells them that they can retain those sins. And that's a, that's a very, very much an indicator when you read that scripture what he is doing, what, I guess, in a power or what a grace he is giving yeah, yeah. these men. Now, uh, I forgot to mention, you know, the, 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 there's another part to confession, which is the penance. And the, you know, the, the priest will do the absolution in the person of Christ, forgiving you of your sins and giving you a penance to which you have to obey in whatever action the priest uh recommends that you do and it's through that penance your participation in that penance that you are participating with christ and able to uh, to receive that forgiveness of sins so that's another important component and why this sacrament has multiple names too all right so that's the scripture uh, there are some other allusions to the forgiveness and of sins through uh, public uh, actually in the Old Testament the priest uh, would sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins uh, primarily at Passover but also in other occasions and how else would they be able to sacrifice for those sins were it not that the person told what those sins were so there's some allusions to that even in the Old Testament yeah I got a couple of questions here one of them is and it has really to do with technical issues Lisa we cannot we haven't put it on YouTube yet we will put it we're going to figure out how to do YouTube live. Uh, we don't with, have enough cameras right yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we're, doing, we're doing the best we can. But what we end up doing is we download it to YouTube, and you can go watch it there. And, and even in the comments section, you can, you can make comments, and we, we'll try to answer those. We'll try to look at them and answer them if we can. Uh, Barbara Mills, uh, the other thing, you can't play it on Facebook or YouTube. YouTube, you can't do it. I don't know what the problem is on Facebook. You, when you go to St. Elizabeth's, Website, you should be able to see the live yeah. version going on. Uh, so try to go to that website and see. That's the only thing I could say. I'm, again, I'm not a technical guru here. I'm just thinking on it. Um, so uh, I guess when we get to the point of the early church, after 
the uh, resurrection and ascension and Pentecost and everything that's written in scripture, we still had a church. And these members of the church were able to have writings preserved also. And what, we, what the value is of that is having an idea of how the early church interpreted those scriptures and lived out their lives with regards to a lot of these issues. And we'll look at some of these specifically with regards to confession. So the Didache was basically the first catechism of the church. We don't really know the author, but there's 12 little tenets that deal with teachings of the church. Uh, this one in particular says, confess your sins in church and do not go up to your prayer with an evil conscience. This is the way of life. Our, on the Lord's day, gather together, break bread and give thanks after confessing your transgressions so that your sacrifice might be pure. So you see a little allusion to both the mass and penitential rite or confession in this reading here. That was in 70 AD, so we're talking about 40 or so years after Jesus died. And, and these things are extremely important. You're gonna see some other uh, uh, fathers of the church yeah. that Basil has put in, but the Didache is an extremely important thing. Uh, if you go and, and read about the Didache and what it did and what, it actually was a missile almost, so mm -hmm. what they were supposed to do each Sunday, um, at, in, in service. Uh, again, I think the one thing we haven't really talked about either is the Sunday uh, becoming... Uh, we did that on Easter. We did that on Easter? <laughs> yeah. Well, we didn't really dive into it. And it's kind of... it's. It, I've had many questions on why do we not... Well, we don't have time to dive into it. No, I know. <laughs> we can, uh, for, yeah, yeah, it's a good one. Because I can talk forever about that. But... But, uh, but it, it did talk about each Sunday on the Lord's Day. And if you have any questions on that particular thing, uh, text us uh, or, or uh, put something in Facebook and we'll, we'll answer that for you specifically. Okay. Uh, another document, even in, still in the 70s AD, uh, the Letter of Barnabas. We don't really know the author, but it is an early document in the church history that we do have uh, preserved. You shall judge righteously, you shall not make a schism, but you shall pacify those who contend by bringing them together. You shall confess your sins. You shall not go to prayer with an evil conscience. This is the way of life. Again, that detailing of needing to confess of one's sins. And just like uh, in the early church is like an acorn, and over through the years, that, that growth in that teaching is going to grow like an oak tree. And we'll see more clarification into what that confession of sins is later. Not that these people early on did not believe in it, specifically how it is now, but that in, in actuality, it, the people were being persecuted early in the church, and it only until later times that they were able to sit down and, and actually think about and write about how the sacrament works. So... Here's another one, uh, Ignatius of Antioch, written in 110. He wrote seven letters. This is one to the Philippians. He wrote those seven letters on the way to uh, being martyred in the Colosseum. For where there is division and wrath, God does not dwell. To all them that repent, the Lord grants forgiveness if they turn in penitence to the unity of God and to the communion with the bishop. So there's an allusion to the hierarchy of the church. That if they repent and they turn their penitence to the bishop. So there's that thought of confession. Uh, even back then it was public, but uh, yeah. more so to a person, to a hierarchy with the power to do that forgiveness of sin. Yeah, it, everything's kind of grown from that point. Like you said, that acorn and the, the full oak tree is we're, we're really grown out from that. But it's that still the basic things mm -hmm. that have that have stayed with us. Yep. Uh, and and uh, Ignatius of Antioch is a really good one. I mean, all of these guys are really great. And Ignatius of Antioch sat at the foot of John. I mean, he was John's apostle. Yep. And uh, he was martyred, and you know, he talks a lot about the Eucharist, too. So mm -hmm. read up on these guys. When we're throwing these guys out, uh, their names, go, go check them out. And they have a lot of valuable information. So Tertullian, Regarding confession, some flee from this work as being an exposure of themselves, or they put it off from day to day. Isn't that like we are today? <laughs> so, yeah. But he is referring to, you know, that exposure of themselves. How else would it be an exposure unless it was done either publicly or in front of someone like the bishop? Yeah. Later on, we have... You may have put it off too long. 
Yeah, yeah. origin. A heretic. Yes, he, he ended up dying a <laughs> heretic, but uh, most of what he wrote early on was well, orthodox. It was, it was very much in, in the churches. Uh, origin, a final method of forgiveness, albeit hard and laborious, is the remission of sins through penance when the sinner does not shrink from declaring his sin to a priest of the Lord and from seeking medicine. After the manner of him who said, I said, to the Lord will I accuse. So, again, there. this is a more clear understanding that there is a penance to a priest. And you're seeking that medicine, that healing, that spiritual forgiveness. Uh, Basil the Great, how about hey, that? That's uh, the man. Here we are in 374 AD. It is necessary to confess our sins to those to whom the dispensate. The dispensation of God's mysteries is entrusted. Okay, so that's a very clear understanding that we are confessing to people who have the power, who have been granted that ordination and that sacramental power to be able to do that. And this is not this Basil the Great. No, this is a different Basil the Great right here. No, not so great. That's who he's named after. John Christendom. 387 A.D. This guy can really, uh, he was known, I think he was the golden tongue. Yes, and, and very much was. So here we go. Priest, priests have received a power which God has given, neither to the angels nor the archangels. It was said to them, whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose shall be loosed in heaven. So again, more clarity as we go along. That oak tree is growing. We come to better understand because people aren't being persecuted and they're able to think about and develop and understand and put in writing exactly what goes on in this sacrament. They received a power that not even the angels and archangels have. And they have the power to forgive sins. Uh, again, John Christendom says, Temporal rulers have indeed the power of binding, but they can only bind the body. Priests, in contrast, can bind with a bond which pertains to the soul itself and transcends the very heavens. So you see there, uh, the power of that ordination goes beyond this world. In the Old Testament, like I said, that steward of the king had power over the ruling, the judicial rulings of the day. You know, who stole this money, who owes this money, whatever. You know, worldly activity needed to be judged when the king was away yeah so now we have priests having that supernatural authority to retain sins and forgive sins and and this is what uh i don't know what's coming up next but this is again what jesus ushered in was what was before jesus did was a was a foreshadowing a shadow of what was to come with christ and christ brought everything in uh, in the spirit, and I think that's key, is that, like you said, it's a it's a spiritual thing that these men have been given, uh, that is stronger, a weapon, stronger than the the physical. Because you, you remember when Jesus said, "What is easier, to forgive a man's sins or to tell him to get up and take his mat and walk away?" and Basically, he said it's easier to do that. Get up, take yeah. up your mat, and walk away than it is to forgive. So because only God can, only or, God, or someone exactly who right. has been granted that power. To so, them. so this that was a this is a powerful thing that has been given to us to these, these men, priests. these priests that we should pray for daily. So uh, we did take a big segue back into that sacrament. I thought it was important because the reading dealt with that giving of the power to the priest and, and uh, of that sacrament. So let's get back to the reading and then we can do our closing prayer. The questions dealt with, uh, that I put in there, why was the door locked? Because they were scared. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit hasn't been given to them yet. They don't have that uh, boldness to proclaim the gospel yet. How did Jesus get in the room? Interesting. God is the risen, you know, Jesus is the risen, through his the resurrected. Yes, through he his can do whatever he body. wants. He's God, right? His, his body no longer adheres to the natural world. I mean, yep. it is now spiritual. It's transfigured. It has gone above and beyond. So what does Jesus repeatedly say? Be not afraid. Just like when the angel comes to uh, people, that's usually their first words. And last week at the tomb, 
Jesus said, the angel said to the Mary, the two Marys, be not afraid. This is what Jesus says to the apostles. Peace be with you. Yeah. Peace be with you both times. First thing he says. So what does receive the Holy Spirit? We did talk about that. That is when they are breathed upon and they receive that ordination, basically, that of, of having the power of the priesthood or the bishop, the bishopric. Uh, why does Thomas doubt? Mm. Yeah, this is, uh, again, we could go back. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. Um, Thomas himself, to me, and I know Basil, you know, has some some other interesting things on that. But but Thomas himself was when when he he wanted to go to Jerusalem and in Bethany, and he, he, they were all like, you know, but but you know, they're going to they're, they're going to kill you. They're going to they're going to throw you in jail. They're going to kill you. And <clears> Thomas was like, man, we're going to go. Because Jesus is here with us, we are go. It was he was gung ho. Okay, so he didn't doubt at all at that particular time. But now that Jesus has died and he hasn't seen him yet, his death, his his faith is shaken. Okay, he doesn't physically see Jesus, so he's not going to believe. And how many times? How, how how many times do we see that in the world? You know, we see we have a lot of these comments with the atheists and everything else. Is I don't physically see him. Yeah. I don't see. I'm not going to believe him. You know, I'm not yeah. going to believe that he's here and that he's God. Yep. All right. So you know, it's kind of a pragmatic answer. You know, if I don't see it, I don't believe. It. I don't feel it, touch it, whatever. See it, taste it, whatever. What does Thomas say after Jesus comes again? My Lord and my God. Uh, the picture that I put up of him almost being forced to touch the side. Uh, we don't know exactly how that happened or if it happened, but the picture represents well, I think, of Thomas being so so humble that he doesn't want to look upon Jesus. He knows it's him, and he, and, and he made the bold statement, I'm not going to believe until I put my finger in the side, and Jesus in this artwork representation is saying, okay, you're going to get it. Yeah, and, he, and when he shows up, he tells him, yeah. come on, you know, <laughs> yeah. put your finger right here. And it's basically like, Thomas, Yeah, you know, so go ahead, go ahead. Uh, then the Jesus' reply is, is, blessed are those who have not seen and still believe. So, again, that's written to us, uh, that, that we did not get the opportunity to see Jesus on earth, but, but you know, we are supposed to still believe uh, in him. Despite that. And I think that's important because you think about the, the amount of grace that Jesus gave his apostles. Okay? And the importance is that they were there with him. They were they were there able to, to hug him and touch him and they knew he was there, okay? And even after he resurrected, they were able to see him. And, and that was one of the, the things that Jesus said right before was blessed the, those is that do you believe now that you see me? And basically what he's saying is Look, there's going to be a time where I am not going to be here, mm -hmm. okay? And you're going to have to you're going to have to show these people that this is what I this is who I was and this is what I did. So we, you and I, in essence, are living in that faith, that spirit that Jesus wanted so much for us to have, that Holy Spirit, and that's what we're living in. So you you have to think that the amount of grace that He's giving us. Is, is even more than what he would give the apostles. And it's hard for us to believe that because these apostles suffered through death and everything else. Um, but the amount of grace that he is giving us, because he said, blessed are those who believe yet do not see. And that's, that's you and I. So we, and it's a, continual, it's a continuous fight every day. And then he ends this uh, reading, John does, by saying basically that we could write on and on and on about this. And uh, mm -hmm. what I have put in here is so that those who have not seen can believe. Uh, not enough paper in the world to write all the books that, that testify to what Jesus did on earth and to reveal his glory, to reveal that he was the Son of God. But it, what I have written here is for your benefit so that you too may believe. So that's how he kind of concludes it. Yeah. yeah, it does end off with that. And I think it's a very important way to segue into what's about to happen in, in, in Acts and everything else. Uh, you ready for a closing prayer? Absolutely. Let's do this. So we're going to do the St. Michael the Archangel prayer for our closing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. We do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Again, we, we appreciate it. Uh, we thank you guys for, for uh, coming and watching us. And, uh, you know, some of y'all that, that wasn't able to, to pull this up, we're going to have it out there. We're going to have it on YouTube. Um, it is, you know, it's going to be a, a recording. But we do, we, well, we, we will try to answer any yeah. questions. I hadn't seen any questions out there. We'd love to have questions. Uh, that's one of the things that, that we're pushing for. And hopefully one day we'll be able to do this where we can have you pop up on the screen and, uh, and just ask us the question in yep. person. Uh, and hopefully live one day we can fill this hall up, you know, and have some good scripture studies. And you get to meet all the rest of all the guys uh, that do this. So. Yep. All right. Well, thank you all, guys.